Okay, so thank you to give me the opportunity to present uh, a new a new topic because uh, only uh, few works have been done on this uh, on this topic: the immunogenetics uh, in autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, we get uh, a lot of money to to develop this project, and if you want to to follow uh, it, it's a bit see project and there is a website where you can see all our work and our publication on this uh, on this topic so uh, we talk about autoimmune encephalitis uh, and paraneoplastic neurologic syndromes what does it mean in fact it's a large panel of autoimmune uh, disease affecting the the, the brain and the peripheral nervous system uh, without specific clinical presentations. Uh, there is a lot of different uh, presentation. You may have uh, encephalitis, uh, you may have encephalitis in children or in adults, you may have some patients with psychiatric uh, symptoms, abnormal movement, epilepsy, and sometimes a presentation with dementia and uh, neurodegenerative uh, presentation, and some patients may have only neuro neuropathy or different kind of neuropathy. Uh, the, the common presentation of this patient is the presence of autoantibodies, circulating autoantibodies in the cerebrum and the CSF. And these autoantibodies, in some cases, we will see that they are able to play uh, a direct role. Uh, these diseases are rare and sometimes triggered by the presence of a cancer. In most of the time, a small cancer that is not already diagnosed. And uh, in this kind of patients, they are called paraneoplastic neurological syndromes because the cancer is triggered by the cancer. The, the syndrome is triggered by the, by the cancer. So they are characterized by specific autoantibodies that are the only diagnostic biomarkers. And it's very important because in most of the patients, there is no abnormal uh, MRI. There is no inflammation in the, in the CSF and nothing to, uh, to, to think about uh, an encephalitis. Uh, and so the identification of the autoantibodies are really important to diagnose uh, the, the patients. And it's very important because if it's a disimmune disease, the patients may benefit from immunomodulator treatments and sometimes can be cured by the treatment. And if you are not able to uh, do the right diagnosis, the patients are not correctly uh, treated. So it's very important to know uh, the, these patients. So what about autoimmune encephalitis? Uh, what are the presentation of the, of the patients? It's an involvement of the temporal lobe. Uh, and most of the patients are characterized by short-term memory loss, altered mental status, psychiatric symptoms, and uh, in some kind of patients, such as patients with NMDR receptor encephalitis, the psychiatric symptoms could be the first uh, presentation of the patient, and most of them are hospitalized in psychiatric departments. And so uh, it's not so easy to, uh, to do the right diagnosis. The patient may have seizures, and mainly temporal seizures, or other symptoms such as uh, cerebral ataxia, movement disorder, and dysautonomia. And sometimes uh, the symptoms may be associated with cancer, but in most of the cases of autoimmune encephalitis, there is no cancer. And uh, the origin is uh, idiopathic. Another particularity of this disease is that uh, the autoantibodies uh, can be different according to the subgroup of patients. Different because uh, the targets uh, can be sometimes intracellular, sometimes synaptic, and sometimes uh, a synaptic uh, receptor. 
When the target is intracellular, most of the auto associated autoantibodies are biomarker of the presence of a cancer. And so in this case, the patients that are older than the other patients with encephalitis. If the patient, is, if the, the target is on the surface of the, uh, of the cells, uh, such as an MDR receptor antibodies, AMPA receptor, GABA B receptor, LG1, and so on, uh, in this case, the autoantibodies could play a direct role to block or to uh, decrease the expression on the surface of the, of the receptors and to modulate uh, the neuronal stimulation. In this case, the patients are younger and uh, the association with a, a cancer depend on the uh, autoantibodies but it's less frequent than, than when the target is intracellular. So according to the associated autoantibodies, we are able to know if the syndrome is paraneoplastic, so associated with a cancer, or idiopathic. And according to the age of the patients, you may also have some, some variation. So this suggests that there is different mechanisms of autoimmune encephalitis depending of the age, sex, and nature of the associated autoantibodies. So what are the triggers of autoimmune encephalitis? Uh, we already discussed the presence of the tumors. You may have uh, abnormal stimulations in some tumors that leading to uh, immune breakdown and the production of the autoantibodies. Sometimes you may have some identified infections that lead to an abnormal reaction and an autoimmune disease. It's, for example, the case in patients with NMDR receptor uh, encephalitis after uh, herpes simplex virus uh, infection. And uh, you may have some genetic origin of the, uh, of the disease, but at these times only few rocks have been uh, done to explore uh, this hypothesis. What does it mean genetics? It's not uh, a mutation that lead to the immune disease, but some particularities of the patients that uh, may in lead to uh, a sensibility, a particular, uh, a particular uh, situation that in some circumstances may lead to autoimmune encephalitis. So uh, we have to, to think uh, what could be and how to explore uh, this hypothesis. Few years ago, uh, some uh, groups uh, try to, uh, to identify uh, HLA particularities in patients with uh, paraneoplastic neurological syndromes. And uh, it was the case for patients with HU antibodies, small cell lung cancer, and uh, encephalitis. And they identified uh, high frequency of some uh, particular haplotypes of uh, HLA, DQ2, DR3, uh, but it was present in less than 40% of the, of the patients and it was difficult uh, to think because the series of the patients was very low uh, to know if uh, these particularities may really play a direct role in the, in the disease. What? Uh, the human leukocyte antigens, or HLA. It's located in chromosome 6, and uh, it's produced two different clays of, of proteins with uh, high differences according uh, the different uh, people. One is to present in all the cells uh, the different antigens. For example, if you have a virus so that we, which produces different proteins, it will be expressed by the cells 
by the HLA class one to uh, be recognized uh, by immune cells like uh, lymphocytes and natural killer uh, cells. Uh, and once they are recognized, you may have a stimulation of the immune system. The class two is a professional antigen presenting cell. What does it mean? Is that it's expressed only by immune cells to exchange some information uh, from the peptides that are presented by the HLA and to be stimulated and to produce uh, the immune uh, reaction. This molecular are highly different according uh, each uh, individual. And so uh, each uh, patient have a particular uh, class one and class two um, presentation according uh, the parents of the, uh, of the patients. So they play an essential role to present antigens and could explain why only few patients are affected by uh, autoimmune uh, encephalitis. So we produce different studies, but as is very rare, um, the, the incidence of autoimmune encephalitis uh, in France, for example, is less than uh, seven per 100,000 uh, people. Uh, so it's a rare disease. It's around 500 uh, patients per year uh, in France. So to have series of patients with homogeneous autoantibodies is sometimes, uh, it's really difficult, but uh, we produce different studies, one uh, on patients with anti yo uh, antibodies and uh, paraneoplastic cerebellar ataxia. And we found that we may have a class two HLA in 33% of patients with ovarian uh, cancer. The same one is present only in 9% of controls, suggesting that it could play a role, but it cannot explain uh, the disease in all the, the patients. So it's only a very low biomarker of the, of the disease. It changed with the study of patients with autoantibodies, again, uh, membrane uh, cellular uh, antigens uh, or uh, receptors. It's the case for anti-LG1 encephalitis. Anti-LG1 anti encephalitis, it's a disease of the, of the patients, of, of old patients around uh, 16. And you can see a typical sign that it's brachiofacial uh, dystonia uh, that could be on the right or the left uh, side. You can see in these different patients, it's really pathognomonic of the LG1 uh, encephalitis. So if uh, we see some, some such signs in patients with encephalitis, uh, we can suspect the presence of uh, LG1 uh, antibodies. It's not uh, the only sign, the, the facial uh, brachiofacial dystonia is present in 30% of patients. The most important is memory deficit, behavioral changes, sleep disorders, and tonic-clonic seizures, but it appears very progressively uh, on uh, many months. And so it's not so easy to think that these patients may have uh, an encephalitis. And the CSF is in most of the case uh, normal. And so it's difficult to think that it's an inflammatory uh, disease. You may have some temporal abnormalities uh, on the MRI of some patients, but the most important is that uh, in 2018, uh, some groups described a specific HLA class 2 antibodies in, the, in these patients. Uh, 
and uh, other uh, works and our group uh, studied that uh, this HLA uh, DRB1 one was present in nearly 90% of the, of the patients. And so 13% of the patients are non-carriers of this uh, HLA uh, particularity. And you can see that the same is present in around 30% of the normal uh, population, the control uh, population. And so uh, there is many different questions about uh, the, these results. First, uh, what the difference is between the patients with uh, the abnormal HLA and the others, uh, the patients without uh, DRB1701 uh, are more frequently younger with a median age of 46 years versus 66 in the others and are more frequently women uh, in 77% uh, of cases versus 26%. Uh, so it was a first result, very, very uh, important. First is that Achela aplotide play a major role in LG1 encephalitis, sorry, in LG1 encephalitis, but 29% of the general population have the same haplotype. So uh, these abnormalities uh, could be a susceptibility to develop the disease, but cannot be a direct factor leading to the encephalitis. So there is possibly other genetic factors and we, we have to increase our population to try to identify other genetic factors. Or another hypothesis could be that other triggers could be particular uh, stimulation in patients with such uh, HLA haplotypes. Uh, one of them could be infection. We can hypothesize that some patient infected by specific virus, if they have the specific HLA, they are unable to answer correctly to the infection and produced antibodies against NG1 proteins, and at the end, develop uh, the autoimmune encephalitis. So it's an hypothesis, and we have to work on this aspect to try to demonstrate uh, such mechanism. Another disease is encephalitis with Casper II antibodies. Uh, at the first time, they are described in three different uh, syndromes or disease, Morvan syndromes, lambic encephalitis, and neuromyotonia. Neuromyotonia is uh, a particular uh, stimulation of muscles uh, that can be uh, isolated. Lambic encephalitis, we described that it was in the temporal lobe. And Morvan syndromes is an association of neuromyotonia and central nervous system uh, symptoms. In the third study, in 2016, uh, we studied the differences uh, between patients with lambic encephalitis and patients with neuromyotonia and uh, Morvan syndromes. And you can see that there is clear differences uh, of these two groups, suggesting that it could be two different, uh, two different diseases. First, the CSF. Uh, the, the, the Casper II antibodies was present in the CSF only in patients with lambic encephalitis and not in patients with Morvan syndromes or no myotonia. We observed cancer and malignant thymoma only in patients with no myotonia and uh, Morvan syndromes. So the origin was paraneoplastic. Uh, in patients with Morvan syndromes and not in patients with lambic encephalitis. So it, it's one of the clues to think that in fact, it's two different diseases. One, in one case, it was paraneoplastic and the other, it was not. Uh, 
And we also showed that uh, other autoimmune dis disturbances was uh, not frequently present in patients with lambic encephalitis, but very frequently in half of the patients present in patients with neuromyotonia or Morvan syndromes. So there is some clues suggesting that it's two kinds of disease with bo in both of them Casper II antibodies, but probably with different mechanisms. So we performed another study to try to identify specific uh, Achella haplotype in these different patients. And you can see that there is uh, a class two particular DRB1-1101 uh, in 94% of patients with lambic encephalitis and in 0% of patients with Morvan syndromes and 20% in patients with neuromyotonia, suggesting that clearly the activation of the immune system is different in patients with Morvan syndromes and in patients with uh, labic encephalitis. It was not the only differences if uh, the all the patients have Casper II antibodies in the serum, in all the groups. You can see that the level of the autoantibodies was very different, very high in patients with lambic encephalitis, very low in patients with Morvan syndromes. And the presence of the antibodies in the CSF was different, high in patients with lambic encephalitis, zero in patients with Morvan syndromes. And another antibody that could be associated is LG1, like in the encephalitis that we described before. It was never present in patients with lambic encephalitis who are pure Casper II encephalitis, but highly frequently present in patients with Morvan syndromes. So it's clear that uh, this disease are different and there is two clear different groups and another one that could have link uh, together. One with Morvan syndrome that is clearly a paraneoplastic uh, neurological disease with malignant thymoma and no association with HLA, low Casper II serum titers and no Casper II antibodies in the CSF. And on the opposite, lambic encephalitis is never, uh, lambic encephalitis with Casper II antibodies is never paraneoplastic, but it's highly associated with a particular Achella haplotype that is present in less than 20% in the general population and 90% in the patients with the encephalitis. And it's associated with a high level of Casper II serum data and a high level of antibodies in the CSS. And so it's the first clue to think that the mechanism of the disease, even if uh, the associated autoantibodies is the same, it's totally uh, different. But we have to identify possibly other actors of the, of the disease that could play a role in the mechanism of the disease First, in the Morvan syndrome, to understand what's happened in malignant thymoma to develop uh, Morvan syndrome, but because not all the patients with malignant thymoma are able to develop a Morvan syndrome. And what's happened in patients with HLA DRB1 1101 to develop lambic encephalitis, because most of the patients with such haplotypes will never develop uh, autoimmune encephalitis. Another study is uh, about IGLAN-5 uh, autoimmune encephalitis that have been described in 2011. In a subgroup of patients, you can see that it was very few uh, patients, uh, eight uh, with uh, a middle age of uh, 59 uh, years, 
uh, and it was an aspect of uh, neurodegenerative disease. You can see uh, a patient with uh, chorea and uh, cognitive uh, disturbances with sleep disorders, uh, dysautonomia, but CSF, MRI, EG were normal. Uh, and so there is no clues for uh, autoimmune disease, but in fact, in the CSF, we were able to uh, identify an autoantibodies, recognizing a target uh, in all parts of the central nervous system. You can compare the staining uh, here with the CSF of the patients, here with control CSF, the differences. Uh, there is an autoantibodies or recognize the protein Iglon 5, and now it's associated with a particular uh, syndromes uh, called Iglon 5 uh, autoimmune encephalitis with different kinds of signs, uh, sleep disorders, bulbar syndromes, or uh, neurodegenerative neuro presentations, and 80% of these patients are HLA class 2 DQB105 uh, that is present in less than 4% of the general Caucasian populations. So it's a very high impact, but at these times, we don't know uh, exactly why uh, these patients have this specific HLA. This just suggests that the immune system play a role in the, in the disease, and it's very particular because if you look at the brain of these patients, it looks like neurodegenerative disease and not immune uh, responsive uh, diseases. But if you use immunomodulators in these patients, you are able to improve uh, these patients, clearly demonstrating that the immune system play a role in the disease of these patients. So what do these diseases with strong HLA association have in common? In fact, uh, when we look at carefully uh, the immune reaction, uh, there is four different subclasses of immunoglobulins, one to four, and most of the patients with HLA association have EGG4 mediated neurological diseases. Iglon 5, LG1, sorry, LG1 or Casper 2. So it's not only a specific HLA haplotype, but it's also a specific immune reaction. And EGG4 are very particular with the ability to have recognized uh, antigens and to have uh, a stimulation and uh, no stimulation of the complement. And so the antibodies are able to play a direct role on the, on the target. So we have to work to better understand uh, what are the specificity of the immune response of this. In patients uh, with EGG1 uh, antibodies, it's mainly patients with paraneoplastic neurological syndromes. And in fact, even if there is some uh, weak association with HLA, it's uh, not so clear of the role of the HLA, HLA haplotypes in, the, in these patients, but they are associated with cancer. And so in most of the, the cases, they could play uh, a particular role. What about patients with glutamate decarboxylase uh, autoantibodies? We work to try to identify the specific uh, HLA, and we were able to observe HLA class 2 DQB1 O2 O1. In fact, it was already known to be associated with immune diseases, and so it's not specific. And uh, in patients with glutamate decarboxylase antibodies, uh, they developed uh, immune, uh, other immune diseases and they carry a, speci a specific HLA haplotype class 2. But uh, it seems to be linked with the immune disease and not to a specific 
abnormalities. There is a possible link of genetic variants that have been studied by different groups uh, and some proteins have been suspected to play a, a role, but it's not clearly uh, demonstrated. But we identified some specific family. Uh, in this case, you may have a patient with uh, antigen antibodies and stiff person syndromes and the aunt of these patients had uh, cerebellar ataxia with antigad antibodies. So there, there is some clues to think that you may have some family transmission of uh, abnormalities uh, with susceptibility to develop uh, antiglutamate decarboxylase antibody disease. And it's reinforced by the fact that you can see that two other members of this family have anti-GAD antibodies in the serum without neurological disease, suggesting that there is different step to develop the, the disease in this family. First, to produce anti-glutamate decarboxylase antibodies, and secondly, uh, to be able to develop a specific neurological uh, symptoms. So we can use the DNA of uh, some family like that to identify some specific uh, genes that could be uh, suggestive of uh, familial uh, abnormalities. Uh, you can see we, in, in this article, we studied carefully uh, the family story of immune disease uh, in patients with GAT65 autoimmunity. And we showed that 70% of patients have family history of autoimmunity uh, with a sibling recurrence risk that is high, and 90% pedigrees with familial autoimmunity showed multi multiple autoimmune diseases, mainly diabetes mellitus. You can see diabetes mellitus in red in these uh, family trees. Uh, or thyroid diseases in blue and yellow, it's other uh, autoimmune uh, diseases. And you can see the frequency, for example, in this, uh, this family tree, you can see the, the frequency of diabetes mellitus and thyroid autoimmune thyroiditis uh, in this family, suggesting that there is uh, a familial uh, gene that uh, could increase the risk uh, to develop uh, autoimmune uh, encephalitis. So we have to work now to uh, collect the DNA of these patients and to study which kind of abnormalities could explain the frequency of uh, autoimmune disease in this family. Another uh, important, uh, the most uh, frequent uh, autoimmune encephalitis is NMDR receptors encephalitis. And there is a study of uh, HLA aplotide, but the association is very weak and we cannot think that uh, HLA could play a role in the, in the disease. Uh, other uh, groups, uh, Chinese groups, tried to identify some specific genes that could be uh, involved in the disease, but the result is very weak on very few patients, and it's difficult to think that, uh, that it's true. But uh, we are working with uh, Professor Mignot in, in Stanford, and we studied 400 patients with uh, NMDR receptor autoimmune encephalitis. And we observed a, a similar hit in 40 to 60% of patients in a particular area with clear genes uh, that was clearly different uh, than controls. And it's very important because clear is killer immunoglobulin-like receptors. And the, these receptors are clearly involved in the mechanisms of the anti-NMDR receptors and cephalitis. These receptors are highly important. It's like HLA, but for natural killer cells, and they play a role to the ability of the activation of natural killer cells. So in the INAT uh, 
uh, immunity. These results clearly suggest that the immune system of patients with NMDR, NMDR receptors and encephalitis is highly particular. And in fact, the hypothesis is that these patients uh, are, may develop abnormal answer to some infectious stimulations. And this uh, abnormal answer may lead to the production of the NMDR receptor encephalitis to answer to the infectious stimulations and so to produce the disimmune uh, disease. We are working uh, on different aspects of the mechanisms before to publish the, this result, but it's highly important because it's the first demonstration that the INAT immunity could play a major role in the susceptibility of the patients to develop autoimmune encephalitis. So to conclude, there are strong association between HLA haplotype and non paraneoplastic encephalitis. This association se seems to be stronger and more specific in lambic encephalitis associated with antibodies, predominantly of EGG4 subclasses in patients with LG1, Casper2, Eglon5, Encephalitis with antibodies of EGD1 isotype uh, present weaker association with HLA haplotype, but may have some specific abnormalities, mainly in NMDR receptor encephalitis in the key uh, receptors. And so other non anchela loci may be involved in NMDR receptor encephalitis and familial cases of GAD autoimmunity. We have to work to collect uh, the DNA and the samples of the patients to increase our series of patients uh, and to be able to, to study the different kind of, uh, of patients to characterize the role of HLA association in the pathogenesis of this encephalitis and to perform larger study with uh, GWAS uh, or WES to identify non-HLA genes that may be implicated. And to conduct genetic studies, we are to involve large families uh, with common autoimmunity and GAD neurological disorders and to collect not only uh, the DNA of the patients, but also of the parents, of the sister, the brothers, to be able to have a clear description of all the potential abnormalities in the families. So we are working on these aspects and we hope to progress in the, in the future of these different aspects. So I thank you very much for your attention and I'm ready to answer to your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Honorat, for that fascinating insight into your important and transformational work. We're honoured. I don't hear you. Sorry, you can't hear me. Can anyone else hear me? Je ne l'entends pas. Ah. I apologize that you me? I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> uh, we will say goodbye to Professor Honora and we will ask you. your questions. Uh, we'll put your questions to him in an email and come back to you. I'm really sorry that we have this technique, the question, we'll email you the questions. But again, thank you, Professor Honora for that fascinating insight into your important and transformational work. We're honoured that you took the time to come today to share your expertise, and we continue to be so grateful for you and your colleagues' interest in accelerating our understanding of encephalitis. We've got time for a couple of questions. The first one is from one of our audience, and it's what, what led you to be interested in encephalitis research, considering that the, the numbers of encephalitis, uh, autoimmune encephalitis, are so low in France? And why we are interested by that? or? Why are you interested in, in encephalitis research? Ah, in general. In yes. the, 
we we could be just because we are able to collect the, the patient with autoimmune encephalitis, but I think that it would be highly important to, to do the same study in patients with viral encephalitis, because we know that there is some genetic clues to explain, for example, herpes virus uh, brain disease. And so uh, could be very important to collect systematically the, the DNA of all the patients and to study why some patients are able to develop encephalitis and some other uh, will never uh, do that because they are probably protected uh, by the immune systems against uh, such attack. So I think that it's very important to, to expand uh, to the other kind of encephalitis. It's a really great point. Thank you for that. Our next question is a little bit more specific. If you, if you get pregnant while you have the antibodies in your blood, is that dangerous for the baby? We don't, we don't know exactly, but uh, we observed uh, a lot of, a lot of Israel disease, but uh, more than 50 pregnant women who developed uh, an MDR receptor on cephalitis. And in all the cases, uh, we observed nothing in the, in the babies. But uh, we have to, to look at them along the time uh, about the development of this, uh, these children before to conclude definitively. But uh, I saw a few women in this situation and uh, the children are normal uh, without, uh, without problems. So we think that it's more important to treat uh, the pregnant woman rather than to, uh, to be worried about the, the children. Thank you. This is the last question we've got time for our Professor Honora. If there are genetic causes, does that influence the treatment or not? Probably, uh, yes. Uh, if we understand correctly what's happened, we will uh, be able to develop specific treatment uh, on the mechanism of the disease and not general uh, immunomodulation of the, of the patients without specificity. So I think it's highly important to, uh, to identify the exact mechanism of the disease.